On behalf of the American Academy of Neurology and in collaboration with Neurology Today, it gives me great pleasure to introduce three colleagues, neurologist colleagues from around the world. Uh, it's been over six months, now seven, eight, I don't know, I'm losing count, nine, 10 months, how many months into the pandemic? Um, so we wanted to check in uh, with some of our colleagues globally uh, to see how things were going, both from a clinical perspective, of course, as well as uh, an education perspective. You know, all of us, uh, you know, we try to train uh, the, the next generations and um, this is certainly having an impact on, on trainees as well. So first I'd like to uh, introduce uh, actually our old friend, Dr. Giuseppe Lauria, Professor of Neurology University of Milan. He's also the director of the Department of Clinical Neuroscience at the Carlo Besta Neurological Institute in Milan. And we spoke, um, man, I would say, uh, I don't know, six, seven months ago. Time, times fly by in, in these days, but uh, it's great to, great to have you back and I look forward to speaking again. Um, and I'm also Dr. Haylin Liu. Dr. Liu, I'm really looking forward to having you. Uh, we spoke uh, in another, uh, another occasion um, several months back um, Helen is a neurologist in the Department of Neurology at the Sir Run Run Shaw Hospital School of Medicine in the Zhejiang University in Hangzhou, China, beautiful, beautiful city that I've uh, got to spend some time in, and where she found the memory clinic there. So Dr. Liu, thank you so much uh, for being here. Um, and then finally, uh, Dr. Bruce Brew. Bruce and I also, uh, we just uh, spoke recently at a, at a conference together, uh, but this is the first time on our American Academy of Neurology uh, uh, interview series. And you're a neurologist and professor of medicine, both at the University of New South Wales in Sydney and the University of Notre Dame in Sydney. Uh, you're the head of the neurosciences program and the Peter Duncan Neurosciences Unit at the St. Vincent Center for Applied Medical Research. And very notably, who knew what would happen this year, but you're also the president of the International Society for Neurovirology. So uh, I'm really appreciative to everyone uh, that's coming. Um, so Giuseppe, maybe we can start with you. Um, whew, oh boy, um, when we spoke um, you know, several months back, uh, we were really in the thick of things and we were learning from you um, in, in Milan and, and others you know, as in Europe and across the world about what was coming and how to prepare. Um, how is uh, patient care practices regarding COVID-19? How are things going now? Um, uh, are they ramping up? Are they, have you learned something? Um, what, are, what are you seeing nowadays? Uh, well, hi Richard, it's a pleasure to be here again. Uh, yes, it was uh, spring and at that time, as you remember, uh, Italy was uh, really uh, the hottest place uh, uh, of the outbreak of COVID-19 at that time. And then, fortunately, it was followed by many countries, actually, uh, all the countries uh, uh, around the world. Uh, well, what has changed uh, uh, much? Uh, because after the first wave, uh, we uh, slowly uh, tried to go back uh, to the normal uh, routine activities uh, uh, with the reopening the hospitals and uh, re reshaping again uh, to the to the previous uh, uh, way the, the management of the neurological patients uh, for the emergency phase, but also for the chronic uh, for those affected uh, uh, by chronic uh, diseases. And uh, it has been uh, quite a long way because. Uh, uh, you know, Italy is quite long and uh, I, I, I work, that's my personal perspective, I work in a, in a, uh, uh, nation, uh, in a national uh, based, uh, place uh, and we, we are referral for, for patients uh, uh, coming from uh, the entire country and actually the travel was, uh, was not allowed uh, uh, for many weeks uh, and uh, also the perception of the patient uh, tended to return to the normality uh, after uh, uh, allowing and introducing, as uh, uh, any country did, uh, the uh, telemedicine uh, uh, visits, uh, which are still there. But what we have learned, for example, on that is that uh, patients, uh, uh, well, appreciated that initiatives, but uh, still likes much more to be uh, on person uh, to, to be present uh, to the visit uh, face by face uh, to 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 uh, to hear what the neurologist uh, can do for them. So th this has been the first uh, uh, big thing, and now 
back again in this new wave of, uh, of the pandemic. Uh, it seems that everything has to be reloaded again and uh, uh, we have to restart uh, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, in times uh, that reveal uh, how fragile is the system and how fragile are the persons while facing of that. One of the big issues here and, uh, and, uh, is, 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 the, uh, uh, is the perception that patients uh, have in terms of uh, uh, danger to enter the hospitals and, uh, and uh, uh, as a consequence, uh, uh, how much we can uh, uh, capture and intercept the, their needs uh, for diagnosis and treatment. We know how the, uh, the frequency, the, in, the recorded incidence of some diseases uh, decreased over time. So uh, this is where we are now. Gotcha. Okay, well, that's very helpful. I'm glad things are better, but I, you know, November and December and January um, are going to be... Um, confusing, challenging uh, months, uh, it seems. Um, Dr. Liu, Palin, um, I um, I really been looking forward to chatting with you again. When we last spoke, um, so first of all, thank you. Uh, the last time we spoke, or actually a actually, few times ago, um, uh, we had trouble getting masks in New York City when things were very bad and you uh, volunteered to send, and I very much appreciate that. So thanks for, for doing that. Um, how are things going now? How is patient care? Um, it seems like the cases are, are quite low and, and the testing is, is very high in, in your area. So the surveillance is, is, is really in play. How, how are things going? Has, is is COVID-19 impacting your, your clinical practice currently? Yes, Richard. Uh, I think everything is changed since the COVID-19, uh, even in China. And uh, now we have less uh, cases, for example, uh, like maybe uh, several dozens uh, every day, each day, uh, because recently there are some cases in Xinjiang province. Uh, we almost go back to normal um, clinical practice in our hospital and in most of the uh, country of China. But um, I think our, we have uh, tested a lot for uh, COVID-19. For example, uh, we uh, doctors, nurses, uh, and the staff in the uh, hospital uh, all had uh, uh, checked for COVID-19. And also we have the chance to, uh, to try the um, vaccine of COVID-19. So, um, and also uh, we, our practice uh, changed since COVID-19, it is different. And I think it also affects uh, every single element of our life. Uh, though there is uh, not a rapid spread of uh, COVID-19 cases now in China. Gotcha. Very interesting. Um, are you still doing much telemedicine or is basically essentially people are just coming back uh, to clinics as usual and there's not the distancing, the social distancing? Is Are things kind of back to the, the pre-COVID-19 days, or is there still some, some measures in place? Yes, we also uh, feel uh, on some social distancing and uh, some uh, masks. Uh, we, we wear masks every day uh, in our practice, but uh, patients uh, already have, have come, back, come back to hospital and we have routine outpatient clinic and the doses, the amount of patients uh, have go almost come, come, come back to uh, previous, uh, prior to the COVID-19 pandemic. Wow, great. That's great to so hear. So we also uh, do more tele um, consultant uh, since COVID-19 because in March, April and February, it is very useful. So we, uh, something has changed since uh, this year. Great. Bruce, Dr. Brew, um, I uh, am really looking forward to talking to you both from kind of a neurovirology perspective and an education perspective. But firstly, I guess, how are things going in your practice? How has your practice been affected um, through, the, through the turns of, of the pandemic? Um, how have things changed and where are they now? Yeah, so I guess at the beginning, um, in, the, in say February, March, 
there was a quite a radical change. People were afraid to come to hospital. Um, telemedicine was there, but it, it really people weren't particularly comfortable using it, both both physicians and patients. Um, but there was a rapid escalation in, uh, in getting used to um, using the the tools, and um, I guess for the first month or two, the vast majority of, so the patient numbers went down, um, but the vast majority of, of uh, patients that were still being um, tended to were uh, by telemedicine. Um, and the, the whole hospital rearranged itself and there was a special um, COVID section of the hospital and people were, lots of staff were told to work from home. That's all changed. Uh, we've been able to um, not clearly not eliminate the virus, but um, we've suppressed it pretty well. And in the last in the last month or so, things have um, have started to normalise. Um, up, up until then, our borders were closed between the states. People weren't allowed to travel much at all. Melbourne and Victoria took a big hit. That's all changing now. Borders are starting to open up. And from a, a medical perspective, our numbers have gone back up um, to almost, almost pre-COVID numbers. Um, but in terms of, and that, that's admissions to hospital, um, in terms of consultations and outpatients, they have essentially returned um, almost to full capacity, but... Uh, about half of them would be by telemedicine still. Mm. And that, that, that's, a, that's, that's largely driven by the, the patients. There, there's still a fear of coming to hospital. Mm. Um, and then, then those patients that are, that are sort of regular patients, usually they'll, they'll like to have a face-to-face -face, um, consultation every few months at least, and the other times, should they require frequent um, review, they're happy with a telemedicine-type interview. Gotcha. Okay, that's great. So I guess we'll talk now about kind of the medical side a little bit. Um, you know, we've learned some, well, I would say actually we've learned a ton about COVID-19, um, both, both how to care for patients in the general medical sense, but also um, we're learning more about the neurological manifestations. Um, Giuseppe, what have we learned and how are, what, how are we applying what we're learning to patient care? Is there a couple of kind of main pearls that you think are the most valuable uh, that we've learned over the, over the first, uh, first uh, part of the, the pandemic? Well, we, we have touched this, this point also. Last talk, uh, and uh, I guess we we were more or less on the same page, considering that uh, there has been a kind of redundancy in terms of uh, uh, linking uh, the COVID nineteen infection to the neurological uh, disorders. Uh, I'm not saying, of course, that uh, there is no neurological disorder, but. Uh, uh, what has happened uh, uh, is that uh, uh, we have been invited by a number of uh, uh, reports, uh, small case series uh, and meta-analysis uh, and a number of, uh, 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 of patients uh, uh, reported to have diseases uh, related to the COVID-19 uh, without actually, to be honest, uh, seeing, uh, uh, you know, strong uh, Pathogenetical uh, mechanisms, which could be, could, 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 you know, could create a strong link between uh, between the two, uh, and uh, uh, quite recently, uh, kind of type of a uh, uh, couple of uh, nice papers showed that even in patients with uh, uh, CNS uh, manifestation possibly linked to, to the disease. There was poor evidence of the, of the infection, but I, I wanna hear what uh, Bruce can, can tell us about that. 
from my perspective, also as uh, uh, editor in chief of, a, of the Journal of the Peripheral Nervous System, so I'm, I'm receiving a number of papers on that. What I can say is that, uh, uh, and talking with colleagues as well, that uh, uh, in terms of the impact of the immunomediated disorders uh, uh, from those uh, with the acute uh, or subacute uh, onset, GBS uh, uh, above all, uh, and CIDP as well. Well, actually, the number of expected uh, cases or this such a strong link uh, does not, uh, to my eyes, uh, seem so clear. And for sure, uh, for the for the uh, chronic uh, counterparts for the CIDP. There is no evidence and actually no single paper. I think there's just one letter showing that uh, there is any, there's been any change in terms of uh, frequency, increase of frequency or increase of severity of the relapses uh, uh, for the disease. So uh, what remains uh, very uh, passion, if I can use this term, is the, is the fact that COVID disease can cause neurological disorder, but uh, actually they are listed as mainly as uh, headache, unspecific myalgias, and some cases of uh, uh, patients with uh, classical uh, diseases from GBS, quite recently a couple of patients with myasthenia, but, and, and so on. Uh, so this is, uh, my, this is my view. Um, Bruce, maybe we can um, get your opinion. I know... Uh... You're, uh, I'm sure you've been actively looking at this, um, but what are, what are your thoughts? Where, where are we going and what do we know? Yeah, I think the dust hasn't settled yet. Um, understandably, people are reporting everything and I think the associations are just that, associations that might be serendipitous. Um, but having said that, uh, I think there's a clear signal of um, strokes in some patients and certainly hypoxic um, brain damage in the more severely affected patients. Um, I think the tantalizing issue is whether there's um, a signal for cognitive impairment. We're, we've seen that in, in a small percentage of patients that we've prospectively followed. And there's a, uh, I don't know if you've seen it, but there's a, a preprint um, that's been released from the UK. Yeah, so I yeah, very interesting. <laughs> Huge numbers and, you know, dirty data to, to an extent because it's all self-administered tests. But I think um, there is a signal for some sort of impairment, um, which I think needs to be characterised. Um, so I think a lot more needs to be done and it, and it needs to be done properly, you know, with a prospective study design and, and proper tools. Um, but this always happens in, an, in, in a new disease. You, you, you always get a flurry of potential associations, case reports, and then the dust starts to settle and you get some hard data. Yeah. So that, that's a perfect segue. So Dr. Liu, um, Palin, you're a, a, a cognitive expert, a memory disorder specialist, um, like me, actually. I focus mostly on Alzheimer's, but... Um, I, you know, when I started hearing about the term brain fog in related to COVID-19, um, the term brain fog is a term that I personally, um, I don't like that term because it's very, I don't even know what it means. I, you know, it, it's like a very nonspecific term. I, I guess to me, what, what either maybe a patient or two have told me or what I've tried to read, it seems like... Um, and again, we, this, this study from the UK is very interesting. It was, it was over 80,000 patients, self-administered tests. Um, so if you haven't read that yet, it's an it's, it's interesting study. But, you know, is this a processing speed problem? Is this a concentration problem? Is this a, an attention problem? I would expect it more so to be rather than, you know, a memory problem or problems with executive dysfunction or language. But, you know, these are, this is why we need rigorous studies with, with rigorous, um, you know, cognitive testing batteries. Um, ideally pre versus post, um, you know, our patients in the memory clinic that we've seen, most of my patients actually don't have any cognitive complaints, but are for prevention or risk reduction. So we have, um, you know, baseline data and then they come back in. I don't know um, what to 
what what it is, but I do see some sort of a change. But is that because of the isolation from the pandemic and the, and staying at home? Is that because of less exercise? Is it because of medical problems not being controlled? I have a few patients that had COVID nineteen, but I I'm not able to glean anything you know you know hard and fast. Um, hey Lynn, what what do you think? Um, our what is your feeling about the cognitive um, impact of COVID-19 or um, do you have any you know, sense of, of how things are? Since so many people uh, we have seen, they're tell, telling us that uh, COVID-19 will cause kinds of neurological problems like uh, nausea, stroke, uh, cranial nerve symptoms, uh, and delirium, also cognitive impairment. Um, so there's some effects that COVID-19 will uh, do to uh, effects on the cognitive impairment. Uh, and also uh, dementia patients, including Alzheimer's disease patients, uh, will have some difficulty following the um, quarantine or some uh, social distancing or some protection measures. So, uh, and also the COVID-19 will cause uh, cognitive impairment and it, it will last for a long time since COVID-19, we cannot see what's the end of uh, the virus, maybe uh, next summer, uh, next winter, I don't know. So uh, there's a lot of things we should to do uh, about uh, to assessment to assess the um, equali of COVID-19 on the cognitive impairment and also the neurodegenerative diseases like Parkinson's disease and uh, other multiple sclerosis. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, there's another thing I'm thinking about is uh, for because of the isolation. Uh, uh, due to the COVID-19. So um, let, there's difficulty uh, to follow up with the patient, uh, really. And uh, there's more and more video-based assessment uh, and psychological assessment of uh, dementia patients. I think uh, it needs to develop uh, to make a better assessment, uh, psychological Mm, assessment of the pa uh, dementia patient, I think. Yeah, great. Yep. I totally, totally agree with that. Um, so to wrap up, and I know we could talk about this stuff for a while, but I, I also wanted to talk about education and training um, because I think all of us are involved with, um, you know, mentorship of, of somebody or some, some, some degree of, of whether it's a student, uh, a, a resident, um, you know, a, a, a younger peer, a junior colleague, we have research uh, mentorships and collaborations, not just clinical. So, um, hey, Lynn, how has COVID-19 affected the educational pursuits? Do you still have students and, and, and junior trainees coming? Do you still have, um, are, are things changed or are things kind of getting back to normal now? Yes, it changed. It changed. Uh, mm, the most difficult uh, period has uh, passed. Uh, since in the March, and uh, we have uh, the, the students are not, uh, are not permitted to come back to university. And also some, uh, um, some doctors. So uh, we have less doctors and also we have less patients. So we have just come back, uh, come, come over, uh, cross over from that period. Gotcha. Okay, and and Bruce, what about what about in your practice setting and in, in in your universities? Um, how are things, and and how have the changes affected training? In, in your opinion? Yeah, it's had a big impact, um, both on students um, as well as uh, trainees at, at various levels. Um, so, similar to what Patty was saying, um, some months ago, everything was cut back. No training, essentially. Uh, remote learning for students. That's all changed um, now that uh, the, the virus is under better control. So students have come back, but the, the, the numbers are, in terms of bedside teaching, much reduced. Um, numbers 
not even to only one student, for example, um, with only short periods. Um, and then uh, the, the actual examination process, I think, is um, in terms of teaching it, is, is suffering. Uh, and I, I think it has to be highlighted that uh, we don't want to necessarily uh, cut corners too much um, respecting this, the COVID safe rules, but at the same time, we can't necessarily um, cut corners with examination. For example, ophthalmoscopy has taken a hit, um, cranial nerve examination has taken a hit. Uh, it's, um, it needs to be recognised and I think um, somehow dealt with. Yeah, I, I noticed that too. We um, uh, we had students totally go remote, and the big gap without learning the cognitive assess without learning the um, the physical assessment exam at the bedside, it's uh, it's a big gap, and and you know you only have one time to train, and there's going to be a you know a generation of students that train quite differently than their predecessors. Um, and you know, will it well? Well, what will be the impact? Will there be an over reliance on tests? Will clinical acumen decline? Um, will they be able to catch up? I hope so, and I, I I believe so. But maybe, hopefully, but we don't we don't really know. So I I, I completely agree that the impact on training is um, is is exceptionally high. Giuseppe, how, do, how about you in, in your setting? Well. Uh, yeah. Our hospitals and clinics were open until last Monday to students, uh, and uh, uh, even though they remain open to residents, uh, uh, the decision was to close uh, the the uh, access to to, to 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 the wards, so the to the bedside training uh, for the students in medicine. Uh, well, I, I, I agree, this is a big hill, and I think, I personally think that uh, we are also losing a big opportunity. I was thinking now uh, to what has happened during the first uh, wave. Uh, what has happened is that uh, among doctors, uh, uh, those uh, uh, who has got the infection in the first phase were mainly the doctors uh, less familiar to with the uh, 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 steroid procedures, so with the safe procedures uh, in a clinical setting. This has happened uh, and uh, uh, I think that part of the training, uh, because we are facing what uh, nobody thought uh, could have ever happened, but it happened, uh, uh, is also the opportunity to to provide the student with uh, uh, an in-person training on what means uh, uh, to be uh, safe for ourselves and for the patients uh, today because it is needed, but also in, in the next future. So uh, uh, um, uh, I have to say that personally, I, I do not agree with, with the decision, which has been, uh, I understand, uh, the same in different uh, countries. Uh, and uh, in my university actually taken a few days ago. I understand, of course, that the number of students is huge. So uh, the, the, the issue is uh, what happens and uh, to, to, to all these guys out of the hospital, how... But, you know, this is our personal responsibility as doctors uh, to, to keep the social distancing, to be really, really to have safe... Uh, uh, behaviors out of the hospital because every day we have to uh, to to take care of, uh, of patients. Uh, so I think this is in these terms it, it is uh, it is uh, an opportunity lost. I don't know what uh, will be the decision for the next future, but uh, I think this is something uh, which would deserve uh, a more you know a deeper debate. I agree. And I think there, at some point we'll know the outcomes, but before we know the outcomes, we're going to have to make some very hard decisions because uh, these are going to make impacts for years to come. Um, you know, in, in New York, um, most of the, during the, during the height of the pandemic in March and April, when things were, were very bad, bad, bad here, um, most of the medical schools in New York City actually graduated students early. 
um, and they were um, actually offered to come back as 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 residents, as interns, uh, and basically graduate early. If they're not going to be coming back to school anyway. Okay, join the workforce, um, and they and they were all it was on a voluntary basis. Um, you know, we had doctor shortages, and a lot of the students said, "Sign me up! I want to go in." So. Uh, it's interesting. It's it it it, it takes on a different um, tone of training, um, and it's much it's real world boots on the ground training for sure. Um, but the, these disruptions and these changes, and you know even future changes, be, because you know I, I would say students and, and 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 professors we got used to in some ways some of the virtual learning. There could be some positive elements, but what are the negative elements, especially with the hands on care? Um, you know, the first the neurologic exam. You know. So much of what we do is, you know, based on our, our hands, based on listening to a patient's, you know, not just the words, but 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 the examination and doing most of that without our hammer and, and without other tools at the bedside is, is very challenging. And if I, this is this is also uh, interesting because. Uh, uh, Tell, tells us that uh, complex uh, issues has to be uh, managed as complex issues. And uh, the, the, for example, here there is uh, this, uh, this, you know, this urgent need, or at least this is what is delivered through the media, that more doctors are required, okay? Mainly, you know, anesthesiologists and them. Uh, but it doesn't mean that you create a doctor, you know, just uh, just uh, because you want a doctor. It takes it takes time because, uh, and uh, uh, I don't know where this tons of these thousands of doctors needed uh, uh, should come from because uh, they could come from countries now safe. I don't know anyway. <laughs> but uh, the issue of uh, accelerating the process of training uh, should be uh, something that has to be discussed uh, with uh, the lay part uh, of the community because it seems uh, quite tough sometimes uh, uh, to make clear that uh, to have that what is needed is a high quality uh, uh, care in medicine and to create that uh, is a process uh, 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 that uh, requires time uh, that could be even accelerated in some phases, but uh, uh, has to be very well standardized. Otherwise, you know, any dementia would be a vascular dementia, and you you, you teach us that this, this is not the case, right? Exactly. Um, you know, medical training in different parts of the world is different. So I actually, I did a six year medical program. It's really one of the few or only programs in the United States where you start medical school at day one. And then six years later, you graduate um, with, with a medical degree as well as a college degree. Uh, most, most of the United States is four years of, of college and then four years of medical school. Actually, our med school was started by a cardiologist who spent time in China and it admired the healthcare system there and came back and, and actually made a, a, a curriculum similar to that. I guess, we're, actually, were, were most of you trained in a, in a similar environment like that, a six-year combined program out of high school? Similar? Bruce, you too? Yes. yes. Interesting. yes. And, and Pei Lin, same? Maybe different for our, uh, uh, our time in the medical school. For me, I spent five years uh, to got a, uh, to graduate, and then three times a bachelor's degree and three times of doctor's degree uh, of medical. Yeah. Gotcha. And then the PhD years too. I guess you also had your doctoral years as yeah. well. So gotcha. Okay. So yeah, I mean, this is an interesting time. You know, a, a pandemic. You don't. At, at first think of, wow, we need to rethink medical education, but um, it, it, it brings some interesting, um, interesting topics up for sure. So um, Dr. Liu, Dr. Brew, and Dr. Laria, thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate your time. Um, I hope the next time we all speak, um, this is um, in the rear view mirror and, and maybe, you know what? I hope the next time we speak, we're all together in person. How's that? Yeah. <laughs> We look forward to for your invitation in New York. Exactly. We can meet the middle. Wait, where's the middle? 
I don't know where the, <laughs> I don't know where the middle is for us, but uh, it would be in the middle of the ocean somewhere. Exactly. That's right. Exactly. <laughs> Let's meet the ocean. on a cruise ship. What we'll let's go. We, we'll have a neurology cruise cruise uh, vacation. There we go. Otherwise, we could ask Rafa Nadal's uh, uh, yacht to, to have a, a nice. I'll take it. There. I'll take. We don't need a big cruise ship. We could take Rafa Nadal's yacht. That's. I, I, I'm a tennis fan, so. Great. You make the phone calls. I have no connections, but um, well, I, I, have, I, I could probably get us some canoes. Uh, some, <laughs> maybe that'll help. So China is the middle. Yeah, exactly. you can come to China. Excellent. And we will. Yeah. Great. We, we appreciate it. Well, thanks, everybody. Really appreciate uh, Thank you. your time today. Thank you. Cool. Thanks.